Widerstand und Ugenbung is German for resistance and submission. The title Eberhard Bethke gave of the published letters and papers Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote while in Tegel prison from April 1943 to August of 1944. For 18 months, Bonhoeffer had resisted interrogations and torture to uncover the truth about his participation in Operation 7, an operation to smuggle Jews and Jewish Christians to Switzerland under the guise that they were doing undercover work for the Abwehr, military intelligence Bonhoeffer was able to keep his story straight because secret coded messages were going back and forth from him and his brother-in-law, Hans von Danani, the mastermind and secretary to Colonel Oster and Admiral Canaris of the Abwehr. These messages were smuggled through books, and many of the books Bonhoeffer received in prison. If a message was in one of them, a pencil mark would underline a word in the title, and then they would go to the last page and see where the letters had a pencil dot under them to read the message. Bonhoeffer and Danani held out hope that the plot to assassinate Hitler would be successful before the Gestapo interrogators discovered the truth. Don Danani kept a list of the Nazi atrocities, and when he was arrested, he asked Admiral Canaris to have it destroyed. Instead, Canaris had it stored in a safe in Zossen, a faraway outpost of the Abwehr. The Zossen files would be discovered on September 22nd, 1944. It would only be a matter of time before the Nazis would learn the extent of the resistance in order to arrest, torture, and the deaths of the participants. In fact, Bonhoeffer realized the failed plot of July 20th, 1944 was the beginning of the end. The plot failed when Colonel von Stauffenberg left his briefcase under the big conference table across from Hitler and then he left. The person who took his place moved the briefcase aside away from Hitler and when the bomb went off, Hitler miraculously survived with only cuts and a few abrasions and a concussion. It was then that Bonhoeffer submitted to the will of God even if that path led to martyrdom. Listen to a poem he wrote in prison entitled, Stages on the Way to Freedom. This is just a portion of it. Suffering. Wondrous transformation, your hands strong and active are fettered, powerless, alone. You see that an end is put to your action. Yet now you breathe a sigh of relief and lay what is righteous calmly and fiercely into your, a mattier hand, contented. Just for one blissful moment, you can feel the sweet touch of freedom. Then you gave it to God, that God might perfect it in glory. Yes, resistance to evil and submission to the will of God are the themes that hold our lessons together this morning. In our Old Testament lesson, we see how the action of two Hebrew midwives thwart the evil intentions of Pharaoh. Thankfully, we know their names, which often go unnamed in the Bible as well as in literature. The women's suffrage movement celebrated a 100th anniversary this past week with the president pardoning Susan B. Anthony, one of the leaders of the suffrage movement. We know her face from the $2 bill. Alas, we do not know the faces of Shipra and Pua, but we do know their names. Shipra and Pua were part of the Hebrew resistance movement to undermine the evil intentions of Pharaoh. It all began when a new Pharaoh came to power who knew nothing of Joseph and his exploits that saved millions 
of lives to get Egypt through seven years of famine. All this Pharaoh knew was the exponential growth of the Hebrews. Left unchecked, this population might turn against Egypt and support Egypt's enemies. Something must be done to check their explosive growth and growing power. The evil of nativism has reared its ugly head. The chant of blood and soil that was heard at Charlottesville in August of 2017 was not the first time this slogan was chanted. It goes back to Nazi Germany of the 1930s at the Nuremberg rallies in which Bult and Boden was fanatically chanted. Soon after, the Jewish pogroms began, which stripped them of their jobs and government, prevented them from doing business with non-Jews, made them wear the yellow star out in public, then vandalized and burned their businesses and synagogues, and finally deported them to concentration camps for the final solution. Sadly, this hatred of those not like us, this xenophobic nationalism of blood and soil did not originate in Germany. Sadly, this hatred against the Jews goes all the way back to Pharaoh and his edict to kill every male born child. This is what he asked Shipra and Pua to do. As Hebrew midwives, they were in a position to carry out this order. The Hebrew midwives could have acquiesced to Pharaoh's order, assuaging their conscience by saying as many guards at Auschwitz, Flossenburg, Treblinka, and Buchenwald said when the order came to gas the Jews. We were only following our orders. After all, didn't Luther say that one owes obedience to the state and that God has placed earthly rulers over us for law and order to restrain evil so as the gospel may be heard? And what gospel is that, pray tell? The one that confuses Caesar with Christ? That forgets that one's ultimate allegiance belongs not to the state, but to Christ? Otherwise, rendering the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God's have no meaning if Caesar becomes God and demands our ultimate allegiance. Thankfully, the Hebrew midwives knew who to obey. And when Pharaoh asked them why so many Hebrew boys were being born instead of being killed, they lied. They said it was because the Hebrew women are strong, unlike Egyptian women, and have already delivered before they got there. And the reason for this act of disobedience is that they fear God rather than man. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote an essay in prison entitled, What Does It Mean to Tell the Truth? This essay is all the more remarkable when one considers that he wrote it in prison after all the lies that he told while being a member of the resistance. Lies to save lives and put an end to the war. Listen to how he answers this important question. The cynic is the one who is claiming to tell the truth in all places and at all times. And every person in the same one, in the same way, only puts on display a dead, idolatrous image of the truth. By putting on a halo on his head for being a zealot for the truth, he can take no account of human weakness. He destroys the living truth between persons. He violates shame desecrates the mystery, breaks trust, betrays the community in which he lives, and smiles arrogantly over the havoc he has wrought and over the human weakness that cannot bear the truth. He says that the truth is destructive and demands its victims. And he feels like a god over the feeble creatures and does not realize that he is serving Satan Thankfully, Shipra and Pua were not the only women who resisted Pharaoh's devilish plan. 
Thwarted by the Hebrew midwives, what was to be done in secret now became a public edict. All male-born Jewish babies were to be thrown into the Nile, but the girls were allowed to live. The pain and anguish from the mothers must have been so intense, so intense that one mother chose to rebel. She would not throw her baby boy into the Nile to drown, but placed him in a basket with pitch and bitumen and set him adrift toward Egyptian women bathing at the water's edge. We do not know the name of the boy's mother, but she and her daughter were no less brave to disobey an order that could mean their death. The baby we do know, for his Egyptian mother gave him the name of Moses, which means drawn out of the water. How hard it must have been for her to be given back her baby boy to nurse and then give it to another woman so that he might live. And we know the rest of the story, don't we? How the invisible hand of God was at work in Moses' deliverance, and yet, without the willingness of these women to resist evil, consider this. Moses would have drowned in the Nile, and the Hebrew people would never have been delivered. Thus, the trajectory of salvation from the one to the many would never have reached the many without the heroic action of the one to resist evil. Are you that one? Will you resist evil as it masquerades as a culture of life, but in reality is a culture of death? To see how this culture is captured by the power of death at work and all its manifestation, one needs to see things from God's perspective. And how does one do that? According to the Apostle Paul, it involves an act of worship. It involves renewing one's mind, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed into the mind of Christ to discern the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Let us begin with what Paul means by that act of worship. In Leviticus, one reads about the sacrifices prescribed by the law that the priests were to make on behalf of of the people. To name them, there is the whole burnt offering, the peace offering, the grain offering, and the sin offering. Of the five offerings, only one required the sacrifice of the entire animal, and that was the whole burnt offering. It is this offering that Paul has in mind when he says in Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, there's nothing that is to be held back, nothing hidden, everything laid on the altar before the living God. God has a claim on our body and our minds. Whereas the animal was killed in the whole burnt offering, fortunately we are not. The offering has, Paul has in mind allows the worshiper to live in the act of worship. Who knew worship was so demanding? Calling forth the worship of God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the worship of our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus did. And so did any student in the wall. And yet, we're guilty of giving God our leftovers. As if God would be pleased with taking from God what rightfully belongs to God, as the sons of Eli did, Hophni and Phineas, when they did not offer up the whole animal to God, but only the unwitted, unwanted bits like the animal carcass. The house of Eli was judged severely for this transgression. Then in the last book of the Old Testament, we learn of God lamenting the fact that he's being robbed of his tithes and his offerings. Malachi will write, will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how are we robbing you? And your tithes and offerings you are cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. 
Yes, we are guilty of not giving our whole selves to God in the act of worship, giving our attention to what is buzzing on our smartphone or what we fail to do before coming to worship or need to do after worship or seducing ourselves with a lie that we can worship God just as well taking a walk or out on the golf course. Not to mention what we give in terms of our tithes and our offerings. We rob God with a divided heart, a divided mind, and a divided wallet. We are more like the sons of Eli than we care to admit. Is it little wonder we are not transformed into the image and mind of Christ, that we fail to recognize the culture of death masquerading as the culture of life? For instance, when we use the language of aborting the fetus within the womb of a woman, we say it is the right of the woman to exercise her choice to carry the fetus to full term or not. I have noticed that when we want the baby, we do not call it a fetus. And when we do not want the baby, we call it a fetus. In other words, life is deemed worthy by the utility we give it. The same thing happens outside the womb. The pro-life group suddenly becomes the pro-choice group. The life of the newborn, our willingness to invest in quality health care, daycare, Head Start, and the best education becomes a privilege for those who have the money to exercise it as their choice. But because we do not want our tax dollars to go to it, because it is not our choice to invest in other people's lives and well-being, we will invest in prisons rather than in daycare and in education to keep us safe from the school-to-prison pipeline that exists in America today. And we will insist that the schools remain open even while we homeschool our kids because the economy needs to get back on its feet and the essential workers cannot work if they have to stay home and homeschool their kids and all these ways. The culture of death masquerades as the culture of life. What we value is given utility and what we do not value is tossed in the garbage. How else can you explain over 170,000 deaths in America and climbing and response by those in power is, it is what it is. But it need not be so. We can have our mindset open to the ways of death at work in our world by first worshiping God with our whole selves. And second, we can renew our mind by allowing scripture to read us, to speak truth into our lives, to read against the grain of self-interest. We can begin by reading scripture from cover to cover to get the sweep of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. Also, we can meditate on the Psalms by reading a verse over and over to digest its meaning. Lastly, we can act. We can actively use our God-given gifts to resist evil as we submit to the will of God for our lives. For example, if you're a preacher, then preach. If you're a teacher, then teach. If you're an administrator, then administrate, but do it from the perspective of one who's being transformed into the likeness of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. Bonhoeffer would agree with Paul that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect on his path to true freedom. Listen to the final stanza of his poem, Stages on the Way to Freedom. Death, come now, highest of feast, on the way to freedom eternal. Death, lay down your ponderous chains and earthen enclosures, walls that deceive our souls and fetter our mortal bodies, that we might at last behold what here we are hindered from seeing. Freedom, long have we sought you through discipline, action, and suffering. Dying, now we discern in the countenance of God, your face. 
Such is the promise for those who resist evil and submit to the will of God. Let those who have hear, ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the church this day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.